question that I want to start with today. And the question is, who is your rabbi? Who is your rabbi? You didn't know you needed a rabbi? You didn't know you had a rabbi? Everybody has a rabbi <laughs> because everybody is being discipled by something or someone. Everybody's being discipled by something or someone. We all become disciples of a way of life, a thought process, a culture, a pattern of life, the practices that we engage in. Americans are discipled deeply by consumerism and convenience. <laughs> is this something I like? And is this easy for me? That's pretty much the filter that we use for almost everything. I know it is for me. And you've heard me say it over many months over the last couple of years. We, we have become more discipled by our media and our politics than we are by Jesus. And we have to turn the corner of that. We have to change the way we think about this. Because the disciples really heard Jesus' message and he discipled them in something called sacrifice and surrender. That was his teaching. He teaches me to lay down my life like him and yield myself to God and his purposes. That's what Jesus does. But that is counter everything in our culture. But listen, discipleship is not a verb, it is a noun. It's not just doing a book study with somebody at a super hip coffee shop in Austin, downtown, or in Liberty Hill, or out at the Galleria. It's, that's not all that it is. It's more immersive. It's more interconnected. It's more about your life and how you share that life with the relationships around you. The best word for it is actually apprentice, which is why we've been talking about this for six weeks, right? We've been talking about how to be with Jesus. Everybody needs to be with Jesus. He's invited you to be with him every day. Be connected to him. Make him the one that leads you. And then become like Jesus, right? We're all supposed to become like Jesus and who he was and be shaped into his image and then do what Jesus did. Do what Jesus did. I think this is one of the most challenging things we can consider and think about in our culture. And I want you to realize that the invitation of Jesus was not consider my teachings. It was not um, even listen to my stories. It, it wasn't even believe in me. It was more than that. It was, come follow me. Come follow me. Let me lead. Become my apprentices. Take on my way of life. Take on my relational patterns, my purpose, and my practices. Like we just read in this story, Jesus' great call to us is simply, come follow me. It's very simple. <laughs> it's just not always easy. It's just not always easy. But when Jesus says this to you, what will you do? How will you answer? Will you be conflicted like the young man we just read in the scriptures who was wealthy? Some people, you, they read that in, in America and they're like, oh, he's talking to wealthy people. Yeah, that's not me. Actually, if you take the whole planet and you put you in the matrix of the richest people on the planet, you're like in the top 1%, most of you in this room. He's talking to you and me. And this is what's so difficult. This man ran up to Jesus. He had the ultimate question, what must I do to have eternal life? And he kind of sounded like a teacher's pet, didn't he? Good teacher. <laughs> Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. He named about six of them. And the guy says, what does he say? He says, all these I've kept since I was a child. Huh? Uh-uh. <laughs> no way. <laughs> really? <laughs> There's only one who was perfect. <laughs> he was talking to him. <laughs> you you got to bring your A game if you're going to talk to Jesus this way. <laughs> 
Like this, this, is, this is all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on inside this, this gentleman who runs up to Jesus, makes a big show of it, falls on his knees, give me eternal life. Jesus' answer is not vague. It is not open-ended. It didn't really have anything to do with belief. Jesus begins to drill down on the man's heart and soul in a way that other people didn't. Just like us, each of us have a challenge that we face, a decision, because following means being willing to let Jesus identify the one thing that stands in the way. To let him identify the one thing that stands in the way, that one thing that we are willing to that we are unwilling to yield on, the, the one thing we're unwilling to let go of, that's the thing Jesus is going to ask for. Right. <laughs> and we got to get used to that because following, what it really means is surrendering everything. Say it with me. Surrendering everything. What? Surrendering <laughs> Everything. Luke 9, 23 through 25 says, then he said to them all, this is Jesus, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Just good news here this morning, folks. Deny themselves and take up their, your cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will f- save it. Yes. This is the paradox of the gospel. Hallelujah. And we, we're not in enough touch with it. it. It hasn't penetrated our hearts enough to do the one thing that Jesus has called us to do, which is make disciples. He says, verse 25, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? This is like a danger moment. He's, Jesus is saying, hey, you gotta be careful because you can get everything. You can have everything you want and be hollow and empty inside. Spiritually destitute and you, you don't even realize it. Jesus' invitation, I want you to notice, was broad. It was like everybody, anyone who wants to meet my disciple, anybody can be my disciple. <laughs> but then the way to life is narrow. The invitation is broad, but the doorway is narrow. It's like anyone can come and follow him, but the way you follow him actually matters. Jesus always talked about the way. It's a countercultural lifestyle. It's not the American lifestyle. It's not even the Christian lifestyle that you think you're familiar with. John Mark Comer, author of The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, he famously said... If you want the life of Jesus, you must take on the lifestyle of Jesus. Whoa. Whoa, what does that mean? Listen, I find that the hardest thing about this for all of us is we like to be in charge. I'll give it another word. I think most of us, me included, like control. Control. Control makes me feel good. I mean... The funny thing is, is control is an illusion. <laughs> it's not, you, you don't have control. Look at the last two and a half years. You don't have any control. But the sense of control that we like to engage in, where we're in charge and we make stuff happen, we make things manifest in our life, we are controlling all the circumstances. This is very ungodly. It's very ungodly. I don't even like the word control because I don't think, like even even people who say God is in control, I think it's better to say God's in charge. I don't get bent out of shape, by the way. If you say God's in control, I'm not going to like, hey, no, that's not what, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) God is in charge for sure. But look around. Is he controlling all the stuff? Man, there's a lot of bad things going on around us. People need Jesus. God's not into control, he's into relationship. Did you know that you, are, you and I are called to self-control? That's actually a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, you can look it up. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, 
maybe one more, and self-control. <laughs> and self-control. The only thing that Jesus gives you the power to do is control what's in here, the decision-making ability. But even that has to be redeemed by the Holy Spirit. Right? The whole, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to react to everything with anger, which is just a form of being frustrated because you don't have control. You don't have to, you don't have to have these responses that are uncontrollable in your life. No, you can have, by the Holy Spirit, a controlled response to anything that happens in your life. In fact, the more you express self-control and for, for what's happening in here, the more other people see the light of Jesus in you. Because they want to know how you made it through that tough time so well. So this idea of control, I think, is something that we all deal with, including me. I know that when I planted this church, it was a lot about my control. I, I, I was sent here, 50 people came with us from Colorado, and we started in, and, and, I, and I, I, I was doing the best I could. But what I realized looking back, see, I didn't know it then, but as I look back, Jesus was using me and being involved in our, uh, in our little startup church, <laughs> even though I was full of control. It's hard to relinquish control of stuff that you have strong opinions about, isn't it? Trying to control people, that's the worst kind of religion there is. We don't even realize we're falling into it sometimes. Control doesn't work for religion. It doesn't actually work for politics. It doesn't work for relationships. It doesn't work for anything except for self-control. So what Jesus is saying to this young man, he knows that every human is enslaved by their own desires, by their own foolishness, and by our own sinfulness. He knows every person, and so he comes to the planet, and he says, the secret to, not, to life is not controlling everything. Oh, bummer, because I like the illusion of control. I like to try to control things around me. The secret to life is not controlling everything around you. It's actually surrendering to someone greater than you. It's surrendering to someone greater than you. This is the message of the gospel. This is the message of Jesus. The humbling of yourself. It's losing your life so you can save it. It's admitting that you're poor in spirit. It's serving instead of lording over. It's listening instead of shouting. <laughs> It's becoming like a child instead of proving that you're so smart. Jesus calls every one of us, and it's, it, that call is about radical surrender to him. 1 John 2, 4 through 6 says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But, anyone who, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Check out that line. <laughs> Keep it up there on the screen. Whoever claims to live in him must what? Live as Jesus did? Do you think about that very often? Live like Jesus? Can I really do it? I mean, he was Jesus. Come on. <laughs> I'm not Jesus. Yes, that's apparent. <laughs> See, it's one thing to talk about God. It's another. It's one thing to call yourself a Christian and go to church. It's a whole other thing to live your life like Jesus lived. But it is the thing we're called to. Can I really do that? I don't know if I have what it takes to live like Jesus. It sounds too hard, too difficult, too, too out of reach for me. But let's be honest, that's not really the fundamental problem. It's not that you feel ill-equipped. It's that you don't really believe there's a better life on the other side of following Jesus. 
You're not sure that (laughs) surrendering to Jesus is going to really produce the life you wanted. Which is what happened to this young, rich ruler in Mark 10. He's like, ah, I'm not sure I want the life you're describing, Jesus. John 10, 10, in the Message Bible, it says, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed. (laughs) What? Can it be better than the American dream? Absolutely. Look around. I want us to, I want us to be challenged here in this series that we start to look at, and I want to lead you into where we're headed. Because 10 years ago, I sat down with a missionary, because two years into the church plan, I was like, uh, I don't know how to do this. I, I, two years in, I got, I got a, a, a several hundred people coming to church, and I don't know how to disciple them. <laughs> so I sat down with Britt Hancock, who's the leader of Mountain Gateway, and some of you know who he is, and I just said, Britt, how does it work? Tell me how to do this, because even the Christians who were coming to help us, I'd be like, like, some people would come to our church, and they looked like really mature Christians, and I was like, yes, somebody's here to help us disciple all these people who are de-churched and really broken, really messed up. It wasn't only a few months later, and I realized they were just as messed up as everybody else. That's why they were coming to a new church. <laughs> new churches get all the crazies. <laughs> it's true, because they're dissatisfied with where they've been, or their, their lives are messed up. They're not... Anyway, that's another story. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> the point is, the point is, I sat down with Brett Hancock, and he started, we had this three-hour conversation, and it started percolating something in me. That was about 10 years ago. So what I'm going to share with you today is 10 years in the making. And we've had different starts and stops. Our church has had things that we leaned into and we're trying to figure out. Did you know that the reason, the fundamental reason is our team sat down and decided to be multi-locational, in other words, to have multiple campuses, was not because we needed to grow, because we were bursting at the seams. No, it wasn't a growth model, it was a mission model. Like, oh, I think, I think we've got to, lean into the fact that this city is segmented into pockets and into neighborhoods and zip codes that really don't play with each other very well. And we got to make sure we're living in community. And the only way that happens, the only way disciple making happens is if people live close enough to live life together. That was the whole point of, of starting campuses. And I want you to realize, like, we, we're, we're, we're still on that vision. I don't, I don't know how many campuses we'll be able to start, but I know if we make disciples as our primary purpose, we'll never have trouble figuring out campuses again because there'll be a whole bunch of disciples springing up in different communities where we all live if we get this. This surrendering, this solution to everything in your life and the solution to everything Jesus planned for the kingdom of God to come into the world. And so I want you to look at this because a few weeks ago we started with love and obedience. In, in this series, love, love, we said we got, you gotta love, if you're gonna be a disciple, you gotta love and obey Jesus. <laughs> if you love him but you don't obey him, like, mm, what is that? Is that a lie? Is it just you're, you don't really love him? I, it doesn't work. If you obey him and don't have a loving relationship with him, it's just dead religion. you got to have both. And both of those things start to fuse together. And that's the orientation of a disciple. And love and obedience is this thing. Jesus said, Jesus said if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. And he wasn't talking about the Ten Commandments, actually. He was talking about his way of life. He was talking about the Sermon on the Mount. He was talking about thinking about the kingdom of God in an upside down way. He's not just talking about an external practice of commandments. He was talking about a change of heart and motivation. And this is what it is. And so then we talked about the next several weeks, we talked about being relational. It is the only way the gospel works. It is transferred relationally. 
It's the only way disciple making works is it's not informational. I know so many Christians who know a lot of stuff and they don't reproduce it in anybody else. They just want to prove that they're smart. The test for maturity in our church is changing to, okay, how many people are you living life with, helping them practice the ways of Jesus? How many people is that happening with you? And I know, like I said, it's simple, but sometimes it's hard to do. Like Peter, sometimes they're like, Jesus, like, we left everything to follow you, right? Like, like we're going to get something, right? <laughs> Jesus says in that passage, yes, you will have mothers and brothers and family and sisters. I think what he's talking about there is the people of God. You'll be blessed. If you follow this, if you surrender, you will have more family than you can imagine. And for those of you that have broken families, <laughs> The restoration of the, church of, uh, uh, of the church family, the family of God, the kingdom of God family that you begin to function and thrive in, that's a promise. But it comes through the doorway of surrender. And so we talked about re being relational. We talked about being intentional. Like you don't accidentally <laughs> become a disciple one day. There's things that we have to practice, that we have to do, that we have to talk about with each other. And we're doing this all semester long in all our small groups. We're talking about the intentional practices that we're doing. And then we talked about being cyclical. That's what that word says. It looks upside down, but that's on purpose because it's an upside down kingdom. The, holes, the whole thing's upside down. You'll see it in a second. It's, everything about discipleship and spiritual formation and growth is seasonal and cyclical. If we don't understand that, we believe the lie of the enemy, hey, you'll never escape it, you'll never, you've been dealing with this problem for years, it'll never happen, and then you just give up. Right. That's a lie. Amen. Jesus is working in a seasonal way, and if you find yourself r coming back around to something in your life, believe that Jesus is working down deeper. Right. That's what's happening. Then you've got spiritual. Listen, we're not making disciples of ourselves. <laughs> We're making disciples of Jesus, and that's a Holy Spirit process. The Holy Spirit is forming people as we do intentional things and become relationally driven and understand that there are seasons of, and cycles that we're in with other people, and everything isn't always awesome all the time. Sometimes it's really hard and really difficult, and, but there's this new season coming, and that is faith in what God is doing over the long haul, and that's a Holy Spirit. That's a spiritual process. And I love what Jesus said here in this, in this little passage. Are you guys still with me? Is everybody still with me? I love what Jesus says in this passage. What he says is with me, all of this is possible. Without me, doesn't work. And so we have to lean in to the apprenticeship to Jesus to really get it. And here's where we're going over the next several weeks. Next week, we're going to start talking about vulnerability. Because vulnerability is what you have to have to let Jesus work. You have to become vulnerable to his words. You have to become vulnerable to his life. You have to really, and you know, you know what the real challenge with vulnerability is? It's you're scared you're going to get hurt. Or you're scared you're going to lose something. The young man in Mark 10, he wasn't willing to become vulnerable with Jesus. He, he, he looked like he was trying to be vulnerable, falling on his knees. Good teacher, what must I do? Blah, 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 blah. All these I have kept since I was a boy. What? That's not vulnerable. That's performance. You can't become a disciple or a disciple maker without being vulnerable to somebody else. We're going to talk about that next week. And then we're going to come into... Uh, uh, the mo maybe the, one of the most important ideas that there is in the identity. You must know that you are loved by the Heavenly Father with, without limits. The love is without limits, and you are His child, and you need to see the world through His perspective. That who you are and who He's made you to be is a person of power and authority and love. But that only happens when you surrender. To Jesus. I love what Tim Keller says. Tim Keller says, Christianity is the only religion where your identity is received and not achieved. Hallelujah. That's good. Hallelujah. Very good. 
That was better than you're saying amen, but it's okay. Sorry. Identity, and then there's something called devotion. Here's the question. We all have, as a disciple, we have to decide what we're devoted to, what we're going to be loyal to, what we're going to be consistent with. You heard me talk about the daily Bible reading. I've just decided I'm going to get the Bible in me every day. It's just one of my ways of devotion towards the Lord. But listen, you're, the thing that tests your devotion most is your time, what you do with your time, what you do with your money, and what you talk about most. There's a lot of guys that follow Jesus, but what they talk about most is fantasy football. The next is surrender. It's at the bottom of the circle. Look how upside down it is. It doesn't seem right. It's an upside down kingdom Jesus is talking about. It's the, it's the upside down nature of God's kingdom. When you surrender, that creates something that God does to lift you up. When you surrender, there's something supernatural, something that comes into your life that changes the way you think about the world. We find Jesus at the end of his life draped over a rock in the Garden of Gethsemane, and what is he doing? He's asking his father. He says, Father, you can do anything. Let this cup pass from me. He doesn't want to go to the cross. Listen, if Jesus gets to the end of his life and he still has to surrender one more time, don't think you're going to get to the end of your life without surrendering. He shows us the way. He surrendered to the cross. And this is what nobody wants to surrender to. I don't want to suffer to this. I don't want to suffer. I don't want to surrender to the suffering. But what comes out of the suffering? Resurrection, life, and power. You can't have the resurrection unless there's a death. This is the way it all works. And then, so we're going to talk about surrender as a theme. And then we're going to... We're going to talk about serving because once you start following Jesus, he said, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, you know what they do? They serve. Those are the people that serve. And then we're going to get to habits because sometimes you get to ceilings in your life as a disciple and you've got to look down and see what habits you've been making part of your life and sometimes you have to make different habits. They're called spiritual disciplines. The habits are what cause you to grow in every season. The habits you do, the spiritual disciplines you do in faith are the what makes you be able to get, make it through every season of your life. And then finally, influence. We're all called to influence. You don't have to lead a small group to be an influencer, okay? I think most of you can lead a small group, but that's not what makes you an influencer. You can influence other people for Jesus, just by being attentive, just by being willing, by being open. But make no mistake, you are required as a disciple of Jesus, as a person who follows him, to influence others and help them follow. And this isn't, this isn't like rocket science. Like I didn't, um, <laughs> like, like, like I, this, this is something that has percolated in me and we've tried to make it part of Catalyst for a while. And, you know, Catalyst is kind of this program that we developed and, and I love Catalyst. It had a lot of impact for a lot of people, but it wasn't reproducing disciple makers. And that's why we had to change. So we'll bring Catalyst back at a, in a different, uh, in a, and maybe in a different format, but we got to learn this lesson first. We gotta go through the process, and this is, a, this is a template, and what you're gonna see is this can go as deep as you want to. Some of you need to spend a whole semester with some other people. Maybe you know some people, they don't, they're not quite vulnerable to God yet, and you need to spend a whole semester on that subject. Guess what? Pastor Ross, none of the pastors have to write the content for vulnerability. The best authors, filmmakers, storytellers in the world have already done it. All we're going to do is put, make it available to you to follow this pattern. See, I don't have to be a creator of content. I need to be a curator of content for you. And that's what I'm committing to. That's what this series is about. That's what the next couple years are about as we shift our mindset. There is, <laughs> there is no doubt that there's plenty of resources everywhere. You, you, you do realize we have access to more resources than we've ever had in the history of humanity. It's called the interweb. And yet, disciple-making isn't on the rise. You've got access to all kinds of stuff. I'm going to help you. 
and I'm going to curate a direction. Because I think the one thing that most people don't realize is they are capable of walking with somebody else and helping them follow Jesus. And if we all believe that, something powerful is going to happen. And I'm just going to make sure that you know there's a, what the next step could be. It could be you need to spend some time in surrender, or you need to spend some time make, figuring out how your devotional life works, or you need to spend some time with other habits like silence and solitude because you're, you're hitting a ceiling. You need to cultivate hearing God's voice in a little greater way. It's all here. It's all underneath here. And I want, it, I want to direct us as a church over the next year and a half or two years to discover what it means to make disciples. Here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus makes it possible. You don't have to do it in your own strength. Matthew 11, 28. 230, and the the NIV says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. You know what a yoke is? It's, a, it's an instrument of work. A lot of us have been working at our faith, but we haven't been yoked up with Jesus. Jesus says, take my yoke. Take the way that I work. Take it up upon yourself, for I am gentle. <laughs> Say it, gentle. And humble in the heart, and you will find rest for your souls. There's rest in surrender. There's relief in surrender. When you realize you don't have to prove a bunch of stuff, all you got to do is surrender. The next verse says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Once you settle that all is required of you is just to make sure that you're helping another person follow Jesus. Everything else kind of becomes a relief. You're surrendered to Jesus. And yes, he will ask you to give him things occasionally that you're like, oh. But what you're growing in is believing that what Jesus has, when you give him everything, is better than anything you could create on your own. That's the power of the gospel. Exchange your life for his life. So I want to pray for you. Just close your eyes, bow your head, and I want us to I want you to just where you are, just maybe you realize today surrendering is a difficult decision and there are areas of your life where you need to surrender and this is your moment. Maybe you're scared of what's next. Maybe you're fearful of surrendering. Would you let the Holy Spirit just comfort you and strengthen you? Would you let the Holy Spirit just counsel you and encourage you that you can surrender and be safe? Would you be willing to offer Jesus all that you are, (laughs) all that you have? And it's okay if you're in the room and you're like, "Mm, I'm not sure I can do that right now. Okay. But if you're willing to be vulnerable, if you're willing to just maybe take one step and say, I I want to understand. I want to figure it out with Jesus. He'll take that. He'll take it. With man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So, Father, we just come to you right now and we make the decision today to surrender. We know that that has to be walked out practically in the next days and weeks and months and even years. But today, we, sh- we choose surrender as a solution. We choose the way that Jesus chose of surrendering to his Father, of surrendering to what you called him to do. We choose the way of surrender in order to follow Jesus, in order to become disciples of Jesus. We ask for your help. (laughs) We know you're ready to give it. 
We ask for your insight. We know you're prepared to help us. We ask that you would move within us as we decide. And even, Lord, we pray that you would help us in our unbelief for struggling. We receive that from you today. We want to be open to you. We want to be vulnerable to you. And we want to go on a journey with you. So help us, Lord, to become all that you've called us to be and to believe that what you offer is better than what we can make for ourselves. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.